implosion. Coaching, three-point shooting, bear poking. I put it all on ESPN BPI, giving Miami a 3% chance in this series. You get those views. Also, LeBron facing sweep is tonight the night. The Nuggets go to the finals. Don't use George. I'm going to think of a bigger Miami has a chance. I was the only one. I'm serious. We might have to make BPI a banned word in the show. Miami is now up 3-0. No team has ever failed to close out a 3-0 series in our league. Maybe that's when you dust off 3%. No! Miami to win right now, 69% according to ESPN BPI. So Boston's still a 31% chance to come back. Is that what you saw from the Boston team last night? Down 10, down 20, down 33. The pile on these Celtics approached mythical levels. And while that was happening, Miami's three leading scorers in game three, undrafted players. A complete culture win. Frank Isola around the horn to you. What percentage of this is Boston implosion? What percentage of this is Miami masterclass? Yeah, and that guy right there, Gabe Vincent, outscored the combination of Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown, two All-NBA players. Miami Heat are 11 and three in the playoffs. They've been outstanding. It's a disciplined team. It's a well-coached team. They have great players. They also have very good role players, but they also play with fight. Something the Boston Celtics certainly didn't do last night. And when they showed a little bit of fight. At the end of game two, when Grant Williams got into it with Jimmy Butler, everyone is admonishing Grant Williams. How dare you try to get in with Jimmy Butler? At least he's willing to put up a fight. Do you think that Kevin Garnett, Paul Pierce, Larry Bird, uh, Parrish, McHale wouldn't fight in game three? There was so much quit in the Boston Celtics. That was a disgraceful performance, and it all started at the end. Of so put a number on it. What percentage is Boston implosion? What percentage is Miami and the culture here and the culture win, Frank? I know that gets a rise. Well, I, I got to give a lot to Miami because I still think if you go back to game six against Philadelphia, Boston was this close to losing, and then Tatum bailed them out. Tatum has been unable to do that in any game. He doesn't have a field goal yet. All right, but you're refusing to put a number on it. We started this conversation with the number three. Three percent was what BPI for ESPN said. I mean, they're not colonizing Mars. They just had to beat Boston, George Sedano. I turn to you. Tony, much like BPI now, I'm going to go 69% Miami, 31% Boston in regards to right. emotion okay. versus culture. So here's the reality of this. Everyone at the beginning of the playoffs was like, oh, I don't want to play Miami in the first round, right? Whether it was Boston or Milwaukee, you don't want to see them because you're going to be in a real battle. Well, now we're seeing that. Yes, they may have looked out a tiny bit because Giannis was hurt, but let's, let's look at it this way. When Giannis was off the floor, the Heat were 10 points better per 100 possessions against Milwaukee and 16 points better when Giannis was on the floor in that series. So they've been really good regardless. They were better than the Knicks, and they're better than Boston right now. It is an Eric Spolstra master class. This is a team that not only has the schematics on their side, which I think heavily favors them, but they have a team that everyone understands their role. And the, the thing to me that's most important, that was the biggest takeaway from a strange regular season for them, two things. One, they were the team that had the most clutch games, 62 clutch games, 39 wins in those scenarios. That includes a couple of games here in the playoffs. And they were the number one three-point shooting team last season. Same roster for some reason fell to 27th. They have found their stroke, Tony. Mm, that, that clutch stat you brought up means they can play close games and they play them well. Yesterday was not a close game. Courtney Cronin, it's 3-0. What percentage is Miami here? What percentage is Boston? I like the 69% that uh, George went with there. That was really nice. But I will go ahead and say that it was an 80% collapse from Boston and just complete no-show and 20% for the Miami Heat. Although okay. I don't want to take anything away from what uh, these undrafted players. I know Eric Spolstra hates us talking about it, says it's disrespectful, but the three best players on the floor yesterday were Duncan Robinson, Kayla Martin, and Gabe Vincent. And I think it was to Frank's point, Gabe Vincent has been shooting 38% from three in 14 postseason games this year. It wasn't just the Jimmy Butler show that we're so used to seeing from the Miami Heat. In four of the top six single, single game over performances this year, those belong to Miami in the postseason, two of which came in the conference finals against the Boston Celtics. They deserve a lot of credit here, but again, Boston really laying an egg in game three. David Dennis Jr.
What are we what are we doing here? Yes, Miami is playing like a one seed throughout the playoffs. They have not lost at home. But Boston lost by 30 points last night. 99.9% of that belongs on Boston and their lack of effort. This was not a choke job because a choke job indicates that you played well at some point and blew the game. This is a step beyond a choke job because they never showed up. Gabe Vincent, Duncan Robinson doubled up Jason Tatum uh, and Jalen Brown in points. Tatum and Brown are 7 for 40 from 3 in this series. And defensively, they did nothing. Duncan Robinson had three blow-by dribbles to the basket. What yeah. are you doing? Where is the, the pick-and-roll defense where Bam Adebayo is just running free? These guys are wide open making these shots because the Boston Celtics have given up and have not shown up at any point beyond game Woo. one in this entire series. Woo. Celtics coach Joe Mazzulla said, it's on me. Is it David Dennis Jr.? Yeah, I, well, no, I, I think that he's trying to do what he can to sort of take some of this uh, blame, but this is not on him. The team just did not show up, and he was hired in the first place kind of in a job that he was not really ready for. You got a guy that you hired right before the season started as a rookie coach, and he's expected to go against guys like Eric Spolstra and coach a team to the finals, and they are giving up. This is not on him. This is about the players on the court not showing up and giving up at, at some point in this play. Same question to you, Frank Isola. You know what? He, he's got to take some of the responsibility. I think with the starting lineups, I don't like that. Just leave Robert Williams in there. But if you remember when Miami, when they had LeBron that first year, they lose to Dallas. And people are thinking, wow, Eric Spolster is getting outcoached by Rick Carlisle. Maybe he's not the guy. It's not so easy to take over a great team right away when you have no experience. And Eric Spolster had a little bit. Joe Mazzulla had none. And I said this two weeks ago. On last year's staff, Ime Udoka, Will Hardy, and Damon Stoudemire. Two of them are NBA head coaches. One is now coaching in college. They did not do a good job bringing in a veteran assistant coach. And I'll say this about Joe Mazzulla. Instead of sitting there talking about, it's on me, I have to do better, he should have said all they do is talk about heat culture. Well, long ago, we, we used to talk about Celtic pride. Where the heck was it tonight? Because that's what so you're putting it more on, on Tatum. You're putting it more on Brown. You're not even putting it on Grant Williams. You like that Grant Williams got or tried to get in Jimmy Butler's head. fight. <laughs> Mm, yeah. Courtney, you? I mean, she was to go, and Jimmy Butler did well it's, before. It's him. hard not to put it on the players, especially Tatum and Brown, because they combined for 26 points in Game 3. And I do think the Boston Celtics have a much bigger right. problem on their hands and a decision to make. Are they going to invest $600 million in this yeah. duo? Is this duo good, not great? But frankly, Joe Mazzulla, that was a lot of disingenuous BS. Like, you had your team ready to play. You wouldn't have gone into a Game 3 yeah. on the yeah. road knowing that you're in an 0-2 hole currently and not have your team ready to play. I think he was falling on the sword and it's a rookie move. So BPI, BPI. says 31% chance the Celtics could come back in this series. George, is there any chance? No, I don't believe so. I just think that they are in over their skis at this point in regards to the coaching matchup, as you guys alluded to. There's a way to fall on that sword, Tony, and I don't think the way Joe Mazzula went sold. about it is, is the way chance? to do it. I don't think, well, how about this? Start by trying. That's all we're asking. At least, you know, the Lakers are trying in their series. When you look at what Boston did in that game three, and again, is Kevin Garnett and Paul Pierce going out like that? That's what I'm talking about at Celtic Pride. They're not doing that. Nuggets Lakers now, the other 3 0 series. Lakers could have won two of them, maybe all three of them, but Denver, too much. And this number one seed that you guys all overlook all season long. They have higher highs than everybody, and their lows are not as low when they slumped for part of a quarter. As for the Lakers, the body language on LeBron here has some questioning whether he thinks it's over tonight. George, you're covering this series on the sidelines for ESPN Radio. You're in both teams' huddle. Is it over? Tony, I think it's just too tall of a task, right? We all know the stat, 0 and 149 in mm -hmm. this scenario, much like we were talking about with Boston. And you look at just kind of the body language that you referenced. It's not just on the floor. It's in those huddles, too. I'm in Denver's huddles. Everybody's talking constantly, not just the assistant coaches, the players talking to each other. The Lakers at times 
you see some of it, but not it, to me, it's not the same with the same depth that you see from the Nuggets huddle when I'm in those particular huddles. And ultimately, I think the Lakers do have a chance to potentially extend this series because to Frank's point, they've been in this, but it starts and ends with D'Angelo Russell needing to go to the bench. I know our own Dave McMiniman mm-hmm. pointed out that a source told him they thought they could lose him. And I know that they need him, particularly his contract as an asset potentially in the offseason or beyond. But Rui Hachimura has been fantastic in this series. You need the size against a very big Denver Nuggets lineup. That, to me, is the move that has to be made. Rui Hachimura has to be inserted into the starting lineup, or at the very least has to get the bulk David of Dennis Jr., the face you're making right now makes me think you want to go at Sedano for something. Please, go ahead. No, no, no. It's not, it's not Sedano. It's this idea that you might lose the team if you don't lose D'Angelo Russell if you don't put him in the start lineup. Who cares? It's down 3-0. You're going to lose the series if you keep him in there. What is, what is the logic with that? As much as I want to say that, you know, I, I, this looks like a sweep. The Lakers franchise, they're 0-8 when they go down 3-0 in game fours. Uh, the Nuggets have outscored them by 17 points in the last two fourth quarters. It means that team is running out of gas. But I got to believe that LeBron James has some, you know, enough pride to win what could be his last home conference final game of his career. I think they can extend this just because of my belief in LeBron James. I think this goes five. Frank Isola. Yeah, and to Dave's, uh, Dave's uh, point, you have Michael Malone coached LeBron in Cleveland. Jeff Green played with them. Think about what they were saying after the game. We haven't done anything yet. Nikola Jokic, pretty smart as well, yeah. knows until LeBron, until you win that fourth game, you better still keep fighting. So I like their approach. But remember, this is a franchise that's never been to an NBA Finals. Think about what it means for that franchise. Think about what it means for the legacies and careers of the coaching staff and the players on this team. This could be a huge night for the Denver Knights. Courtney Cronin. Michael Malone said it perfectly. They're fighting human nature. Of course, the natural inclination is, hey, you're up 3-0. You can take your foot off the gas a little bit. And it was Jokic who said he is worried about having LeBron James on the other side because he can do everything, but he needs help. And to point out something about D'Angelo Russell, he's minus 53 in this series. I don't know how that's possible. He's plus 45 in the series against the Grizzlies. They don't have an answer for Jamal Murray, and they won't again. Right, right. But I... I isn't it tiresome, though, to find a scapegoat in, in someone named Russell? This Lakers season started blaming someone named Russell, and it ends blaming someone. I mean, you got LeBron, you got Davis. You know, you just got to close out in the fourth quarter. This series, by the way, has been a passing of the torch for flopping. LeBron outdone by Jokic. And in the other series, Lowry and Smart is like Vladi Diva looking in a mirror. Oh, give me a break. <laughs> We'll be back. <laughs> Fire cell next. Welcome back to Around the Horn, brought to you by Chase. Coming to you from the Seaport District at Pier 17. Who won the PGA Championship? Brooks Kepka, his fifth career major, which puts him in rarefied air. After defecting to LIV and admitting his vulnerabilities. But who won the PGA Championship? I submit Michael Block. The dream in a dream inception. 46 year old club pro from Mission Viejo. Just when you thought it was as good as it could get, he made the cut. And then he was contending. And then it couldn't get better. The hole in one that just dreamed its way in. Finishes top 15, which means he goes back next year. He's got an exemption. For Colonial this upcoming week, I admit, it's a bizarre question when one guy finished first and the other guy finished 15th. But George, who won the PGA? Tony, I'm going with Michael Block. This is a man who shot a 58, a course record at Coto de Casa back in 2022 last year. He has made only $38,000 in career earnings yeah, before this, this, this weekend. Busy, he made 288 yeah. grand this weekend. Give that man some love. Yeah. Courtney Cronin, who won the PGA Championship? Brooks Kepka did, but to the point of Michael Block, this is as close as I've ever gotten to having a moment what is that? like he did. I got a birdie once on a hole in my golf league. I didn't and get $288,000. Okay. <laughs> but, um, you know, for Brooks Kepka with Live Golf, like this is not about, hey, a Live Golfer won a PGA event. This is about Brooks Kepka being healthy, being in the right yeah. mindset, and being able to contend for a major. And he was able to do just that and, and deal with some really difficult course conditions along the David way. David Dennis Jr. 
This is by Michael Block. Golf is a beautiful sport, everybody. Dreams come true. These things can happen. This guy was was charging 150 bucks for lessons. It would take him 2,300 lessons to make the amount of money he made wow. this weekend. And on top of that, like the way that we talk about golf so much lately has been all about live and Saudi money and gaslighting and all this negativity. This is a reminder of how beautiful this sport can be. And by the way, if you make a hole in one, you should get a lifetime invite no matter where you end up uh, in the rankings. You should go to be able to go to all the tournaments. Uh, going Greg forward. Isola. In the last 73 years, seven guys have won their fifth major by the age of 34. Brooks Kepka is on yeah. that list. And that yeah. includes Tiger Woods, list. Arnold Palmer, Jack Nicklaus. That is pretty good. So his legacy won, but the weekend, come on. Everyone thinks on a par three, you might get lucky enough to hit a hole in one. You're not going to get lucky enough to do it and then also win $288,000. Oh, he swished it, too, which is amazing, right? And he's playing with Rory McIlroy, and he's such a convivial guy, right? I mean... He may not. He, he may love being a club pro. I'm sure he does. He may not have to go back. Just put him on TV. Yeah. I mean, he can talk. Wow. What a dream. We'll move on. WNBA <laughs> opening <laughs> weekend. Headlines on headlines. Brittany Griner's return Friday night in Los Angeles. It was emotional. It was huge. Then the home return Sunday in Phoenix where she had a game high 27. Hitting the three was just a release, I'm sure. Amazing. Brianna Stewart debut with the Liberty. A blowout loss Friday night in Washington. Coming back yesterday, 45 and three quarters. Blowout win at home in Brooklyn. The Aces, game one is defending champs and doing it without Becky Hammond, who is serving her suspension from the league for violating respect in the workplace. They won by 41. Courtney, what stood out most from NBA's opening weekend? You listed off a litany of storylines there. Of course, Brittany Griner and her return is at the very top of that. But frankly, I don't feel like there was enough coverage of WNBA's opening weekend. Think about the incredible co women's college hoop season that we had right before this. Being able to capitalize on some of that momentum. We've got super teams. All of the other storylines. The WNBA needs to open up its locker rooms to its media members so we can tell the best possible stories and expand the exposure of oh the i see you mean coverage in that the players are well it's currently collectively bargained right that they are not open and available in this instance to my understanding that it's the player's decision to not have open locker room which i can understand to a degree but if you want to grow this game and we should be because of all of these incredible things that are happening within it from opening weekend you've got to expand the access and that includes locker david room. dennis jr your takeaway from opening weekend this weekend is quite simply about Brittany Griner. I mean, the story of her being able to just step foot on a court after what she's been through is a triumphant story in itself and one of the most inspirational stories you could have in sports. But to come back 27 and 4, only the second player in the WNBA history to start a season 20 with 20 and 4 in the first two games of a season. You got to remember, this Mercury team was in the finals two seasons ago uh, with, with Griner on that team, and having her back playing like this puts them back in contention. But beyond that, this is just an incredibly inspirational Frank story. Isola. Brianna Stewart gives the Liberty Hope. Remember, that's an original team that's been to a finals but has never won. I just think, though, the Las Vegas Aces, looking at what they did, they look like they're just going to dominate the entire league, and good luck to everybody else. It looks like it's their year George again. Dono. Tony, I'm with David. This is about BG. She had an incredible defensive performance the first two games. Team shot, I believe, 3 of 12 against her as the primary defender, several blocks, and a nearly flawless offensive performance. Considering everything she's been through, to me, this is all about BG, both on and off the floor. you ever seen her coach, Vanessa Nygaard, Called out the Los Angeles fans for not selling out Friday night for the Griner return. They had 55% capacity. And then Phoenix plays their first home game, and they got about 88% capacity. They still, I mean, that, that was, seemed to be an, an odd subplot to the, this weekend as well. Don't tell fans how to spend their money. How about that? Leave the fans and the customers alone. George is down to Courtney Cronin. Thank you for your time. David Dennis Jr., Frank Gaisola. Showdown. Next. NHL Conference Finals, every game so far has gone to overtime. Last night, Golden Knights 3, Stars 2. Both series, Florida, Carolina, and Vegas, Dallas 2-0, despite the razor-thin margin. David, about last night, did the Knights win it or Stars lose it? 
This is about the Golden Knights. In this playoff, they're 3-0 in overtime, 4-0 in one-score uh, games, 7-3 when going down by one goal. This is what they do. They're a clutch team. Mm -hmm. Frank Isola. Nah. This is about the Stars. You showed the highlight. They got caught in a line change in overtime. It was a four-on-three. And then they had the giveaway, which led to the tying goal. They're 0-4 in the, in the overtime this postseason, Dallas. Their fault. David, you're right. Absolutely right. But Frank, noting the line change and getting caught there, that's what decided the game. Split that point 2-1. to one. Going into showdown, too. Carmelo Anthony announcing his retirement from the NBA today in video form. Frank, how will you remember Carmelo Anthony? Oh, it's those five days that he's done with the Atlanta Hawks. It has to be. Now, I'm going to remember Carmelo as a great scorer. I was there when he scored 62 at Madison Square Garden. I was in London when he had 37 and 14 minutes against Nigeria, and he was a great guy to cover. Good luck, Carmelo. David Dennis Jr. Our Carmelo Anthony, incredible scorer, incredible international player, but one of the most memeable athletes of all time. The picture of him staring at Rihanna, the fake jump shot, all the memes that came out of Carmelo Anthony's career made him an Internet legend. Mm-hmm. I'll remember him as an Atlanta Hawk. <laughs> Isola, 30 Five seconds days. of FaceTime. Yeah. Ah, I love Carmelo. So uh, Ben Roethlisberger has a podcast. Why? Because everyone has a podcast. And he had Kenny Pickett on the current quarterback for the Pittsburgh Steelers. And Big Ben admitted, I kind of wanted you to fail in your first season. Why? Because I didn't want people to forget about me. Now, you could say, man, that's a little harsh. But be honest now. How about some of these legendary coaches when they leave? You really think deep down, isn't it human nature maybe to want the guy that replaces you not to do so well? Just so we know, I wanted George, Courtney, and David to do really well. I knew you were going to say that. That's it for Isola.